Thank you for having us here. Uh, like the, the topic of uh, today is attracting domestic capital for the alternate investment uh, funds. And we've got a, a panel here, a lot of guys here who have great experience in this field. Uh, the industry, by any standards, has done uh, fairly well. When you look at it in terms of the commitments or intended fundraising, it's been about 70,000 crores of fundraising from the AIF, uh, uh, from the AIF space. 35,000 crores of sort of commitment coming, 28,000 crores of actual investment. So pretty good numbers, pretty impressive numbers by any standards. And the bulk of this money is domestic investment, which is, which is pretty good. Uh, what, uh, what we thought we'd just do is over the next few minutes, uh, ask our fellow panelists about their views and what's happening in the domestic space. Uh, one, we do believe, because you know, as being large players, in, even in the public markets, so in public equity markets where we are large players in those markets were earlier dominated to a great extent by uh, global investors. But when you look at what's happening in the sector now, it's primarily domestic investors who are really driving the market over the last some time. With flows of close to you know, five-ish, six-ish thousand crores coming in every month, typically from domestic investors itself. So that shows that there's a huge amount of potential in the domestic market too. So let's see how we can try to extend this to what's happening in the uh, in the, uh, in the uh, AIF space too. So maybe what I can start off with is uh, out here, Vishal. Vishal, just your inputs. You been guys have been doing fundraising from 2006. The bulk of your money, as I understand it, is primarily domestic. So just wanted your perspective, your thoughts, and, uh, and your experience. So what you could share with us, which could help all of us. Right. Uh, so clearly, you know, when we started in 2006, uh, you know, we started with a simple uh, private equity fund structure where we would have invested in unlisted companies. Uh, uh, over the last 10 years, we've raised close to 3,500 crores, out of which uh, 2,000 odd crores is on the real estate side and 1,500 crores is on the private equity side. Real estate is something where the entire capital has been raised from uh, high net worth individuals in India. And uh, private equity... Um, you know, only 30, 30, one third of the money has been raised in India and two third has been raised outside. Uh, and close to one third of the money that we raised in India is something that we contributed to the fund. So clearly on the private equity side, we've not raised uh, that much of uh, domestic capital. And that has got to do with the maturity of uh, a typical uh, Indian investor, uh, where for them liquidity is paramount. And uh, in a private equity kind of a structure, you invest over a period of three to four years and uh, you know harvest uh, after that. So for a long period of time, four to five, six years, you're not going to see the money back. And a lot of these people have a sense that, you know, are they putting money in some kind of a bottomless pit? Um, and uh, that does, that creates a lot of uh, uh, anxiety in the minds of the Indian investors uh, and largely they are an impatient slot. And we've seen, uh, we've seen uh, that happening even on the public side where uh, sure. uh, you know, patience is something which uh, is not there yet. I think it will evolve over a long period of time, uh, but any time in the ne near future, let's say three, four, five years, I don't see a lot of domestic capital coming in uh, for a typical private equity fund structure. If you talk about a debt product, or if you talk about uh, real estate, where uh, which has a regular coupon, and uh, you know which the duration is much shorter, um, you're going to see a lot of capital being uh, being raised there. And even now, when the interest rates are extremely benign, you know uh, you don't have a lot of products which can give you uh, you know eight, nine, ten percent post-tax return. Even on the debt side, uh, I do believe uh, a structured debt kind of a fund, which could be real estate or which is something which uh, Rahul has raised, uh, should appeal to a lot of Indian uh, investors. As far as uh, domestic institutions are concerned, uh, you know, we've not uh, had much success with them, uh, but hopefully, uh, you never know, I think the insurance market again is maturing enough. Uh, that's one pool of capital that definitely can be attracted. Uh, but as far as banks are concerned, uh, we believe, uh, you know, it's a long way to go before you start seeing any capital from them. Thanks, Vishal. Uh, 
Uh, Rahul, may I just request your inputs on this because uh, I understand you've had a highly successful uh, fundraise in the last some time and you have a rather differentiated approach of fundraising and it's primarily from the institutional space. So happy to seek your inputs and your experience of how it's worked for you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you know, I think we've been lucky. <laughs> Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, I think good product sells and I think to Vishal's point, I think there are large pools of money that are looking for relatively predictable range-bound returns. And I think as we were looking to put together the fund strategy, you know, one of the things we said is, well, who's the right audience for a range-bound, predictable, coupon-bearing instrument and which has a little bit of an equity kicker? Uh, and so as we went out and started talking to Indian institutions, what we found is that the uh, CIOs in large insurance companies didn't have the risk appetite to get involved with venture capital. And, and to Vishal's point, you know, had been a little bit burnt by the duration risk of private equity, but were hungry for products that actually paid out. You know, and it was not the fact that we were giving them money every quarter, but the fact that there was certain income coming in, I think was something that helped them get over the line. So as of last count, uh, we've raised about 400 crores. Uh, the lion's share of that is from a couple of banks and mostly insurance companies, both life and general, both private sector and public sector. We've also gotten support from SIDBI, who I think is playing an increasingly active role. And then, you know, a couple of corporate treasuries have also stepped up and said, hey, we also need to sort of smoothen out our returns and with our equity being fairly volatile um, and fixed income returns generally going down, how do we continue to meet a certain threshold IRR target that we have as a treasury? And there's a lot of Indian companies and well, actually there's a few that are sitting on lots and lots of cash. Um, and so I think in a lot of ways, you know, the answer to the question is um, look at the pain that these large institutions have on deploying lots of capital and see if your product has certain elements to it that can be more credit-like or more coupon-like. Because I think there's a real hunt for yield. And if, as you structure deals and as you put your fund together, if you can have income coming in sooner, I think that creates a baseline return that a lot of investors are actually looking for. Thank, thanks, Rahul. Muthu, if uh, I could seek your inputs on this, primarily because uh, you represent a very large brand, a brand which is you know very well recognized in the markets. It's sort of a you know a, a large player in the financial services space too, a large corporate player, and you've been on different sides. Uh, uh, you used to look after the M&A for the uh, the Birla Group, so you'd obviously come from both sides. You'd have a different perspective. And you guys have also been doing a lot of fundraising from what I, uh, in the past have done a lot of fundraising too, from both institutions and domestic uh, uh, H&Is. So just your take on what's happening. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> First, uh, I agree with uh, the comments both uh, Vishal and uh, Rahul made. Uh, I think Vishal started by saying that you know, Indian domestic uh, institutional investors is probably not uh, well versed or used to uh, private equity. Uh, and Rahul talked about, you know, sort of uh, putting the product uh, as appropriate as uh, the customer wants, which, you know, uh, fundamentally has two elements, you know, regular return seeking and, uh, you know, uh, churn of capital that Vishal talked about. Uh, but if you sort of take a macro view, I'm slightly more optimistic for times to come. Uh, I think that indeed is uh, an appropriate, uh, you know, sort of articulation of uh, what happened in the past. Uh, the reason why I'm slightly more optimistic is, uh, you know, uh, there are two pools of domestic capital which is, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, opening up. Uh, one in a small way, very small way, and the other one uh, in a reasonably big way. Uh, the one that's uh, uh, opening up in a reasonably big way is, I think, the insurance companies. Many of the insurance companies uh, are, uh, you know, uh, in principle, uh, you know, already setting aside money uh, for private equity. Uh, it is another story that, you know, they go, they're going to be uh, quite a while away to actually deploy the capital, uh, but I think they have taken the first step of uh, allocating 2 to 3 percent of their, uh, you know, sort of uh, capital. And, uh, you know, day by day this money is uh, going up. Uh, you know, today, uh, it, you know, you can easily count 3 lakh to 4 lakh crores of uh, capital uh, in the private insurance companies. 
then you have the traditional uh, investors, institutional investors, uh, you know, which is, uh, sorry, uh, the second small pool of money which is coming is actually the PF. Uh, if you look at the numbers, you know, the total PF money in India is 1.1 lakh crore, out of which bulk of it, about 90,000 is from the public sector or the government. Uh, it's only a very small money which is actually, you know, in the private sector and, uh, you know, it's got to be by election, you know, the, uh, the, the, the investor into the PF actually chooses whether the money will go to alternates or not. Uh, I think it's uh, the way of, uh, you know, creating the comfort in the market. Uh, you know, uh, over a period of time, hopefully, you know, some pocket of the 90,000 crore will open up, a 90,000 lakh crore will open up and uh, the, uh, you know, uh, private will hopefully also build up in times to come. So that's on the new avenue of uh, capital for private equity into the domestic pool. Uh, I think the traditional ones are uh, two pockets. One is uh, HNIs, uh, and the second one is, uh, you know, institutions. Uh, our experience is uh, that, you know, both are, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, equally available. Uh, if you look at uh, the fundraise that we did, which is quite a while ago now, uh, you know, we have half of it coming from HNIs and half of it coming from institutions. Uh, but there are a lot of fundraisers that have happened, uh, not so much in the traditional private equity, but more into real estate and infra uh, from the domestic houses, uh, you know, through the institutional, uh, through the, you know, high net worth route. On the institutions, it's predominantly banks and, you know, uh, largely LIC and maybe a couple of other insurance companies. Uh, I think, you know, uh, for the past few years, that pocket had dried up, uh, but you know, uh, like it happens everywhere else, it's, it's in cycles, and uh, you know, people have now started to look at uh, proposals, and they're keen at uh, looking at opportunities. Uh, banks, uh, you know, fundamentally is a misfit for private equity. I mean, you shouldn't expect nowhere in the world actually, you know, you expect bank to put in, uh, into the private equity but they are the biggest investors in the domestic pool in India. Uh, so hopefully the way, you know, we will correct is uh, by other people catching up, not by banks going off. Uh, they are still a reasonably big pool of capital and, uh, you know, I hope over a period of time others uh, will catch up. Uh, of course, the topic is domestic institutions, um, but I think uh, I uh, sort of echo Vishal's point of view. Domestic market is uh, still shallow and uh, we will look for international capital, but that's, uh, you know, exactly in line with uh, what happens in any other, you know, sort of capital space in India, whether it is public equity or infra or debt, you know, bulk of money comes, anyway, we are a net capital importer. So to that extent, you know, we will continue to be so, and, you know, we need to look at international pool as well. So domestic can be a good anchor, good base, uh, you know, uh, for you uh, to d re uh, rely purely on uh, domestic may not be the most appropriate strategy. Thanks, Muthu. Uh, Gaurav, as uh, someone who allocates money and as someone who's, uh, you know, actually uh, s sort of on the investment committee, making investments in various uh, funds, uh, what, do you, what do you see? What do you look at? I mean, you know, what are your inputs for everybody out here, including ourselves? Is that what would you believe is the, uh, you know, is 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 required, or what, from an institutional perspective, if we are to cater more to to get domestic institutional money, what should we be looking at? Uh, what are the points we need to address so as to get a lot more institutional money into the space? So what I'm saying is that my being here might be a little bit odd because I do represent the government of the United Kingdom in terms of us bringing in uh, capital in India for the purpose of economic development. So what we, our experience has been, uh, it's been about bringing in our capital, making it work like domestic capital, and getting domestic investors comfortable to, on the concept to be able to work with us. So that's the, the larger theory of why I'm here and what we are trying to do. So let me unpack that a little bit more. In terms of you know, what we've done, we have a portfolio of about 265 million that is committed across many uh, GPs. So it's, it's, a, it's many funds, and they are very different in character. Some of them are funds which we have conceptualized from the start, where we have been the anchor investors in, and we have picked partners which are similar to ours, like Government of India DFIs, like SIDBI, 
SBI. So we have a Samriddhi fund, for example, an impact investment fund, where we are the anchor investors, and we manage to, through our investment and the anchor investment of our credible sponsor, got LIC and some other insurance companies to put in a bit of their money. So what you need is a little bit of a concept, a little bit of confidence, and a little bit of collaboration, because it does take a lot of effort to convince institutional investors in India who are domestic, you know, why should they be worried about this class when their comfort is not with this class? Their comfort is very much with the listed security, giving a definite yield return, and the tolerance for risk is not there at all. So how do you then, you know, play with them, work with them, give them comfort about the concept, about the fact that, yes, there could be one or two companies in your structure that will fail. But overall, this asset class will also give you returns, and perhaps there will be a place in your strata of return and risk-adjusted returns where this adds as a good diversification for you. So we are in that process. We've had limited success, just like what other colleagues have said here on the panel. It's not very easy because there is this inertia, there is this risk aversion to this asset class, but we are working with, with uh, even we are working with the PF uh, colleagues as well, trying to work from the government lens, government partnership comfort lens, to really understand where their concerns are and how do you unlock those. And actually what comes across quite clearly are a couple of points in terms of whether it's a pain point, in terms of what uh, issues they are feeling, facing, like what Rahul was mentioning, or the fact that there are huge information asymmetries in this, in this setup for them to be able to get comfort. The data and the returns are not, on average are not very easily available. And if you look at the perspective of people who manage these pots of money, they need to do a lot of extra work to be able to get comfort with this kind of information, which perhaps is not something that they are used to doing. And we need to be able to handhold them uh, and to be able to sort of be uh, the, the, the person or the institution that is bringing that that comfort to them. So again, I would just summarize my comments in, in, in the three ways, that there has to be a concept. And it's more likely that we will get domestic investors more uh, you know, warm to the, a debt or a mezzanine or a structured kind of concept to begin with. They will probably stay very far away from the VC space uh, as it's known, unless it's de-risk for them in a way that they understand. Private equity and long-term private equity, asset classes like infrastructure, real estate, are where my hopes are there. We feel that collectively, as a group, we can work with them to get them sort of uh, more warm to the idea, and we are seeing early signs of them committing their capital, at least in the five or six products that we have. Just one more uh, anecdotal evidence. We also work with uh, government as GPs. So we're working with Rajasthan Venture Capital Fund, we're working, uh, we've, we're, we're working very early with the Madhya Pradesh Venture Capital Fund. So in some ways, what we're trying to do is get these domestic players comfortable with a little bit of the government approach, because many of them are government insurance fund managers. And if they feel that they are working with a government or a government-supported, government-anchored fund, then there's a bit of comfort in them to be able to, uh, you know, then move on to pure private, pure commercial sort of plays. So that's the contribution that I have. Yeah. Thanks, Guru. Uh, so, I guess what we hear so far is that uh, uh, domestic investors primarily prefer the, the debt space. They're a little cagey, a little wary of what's happening on the PE space, you know, on account of tenure and various other things. Uh, and while everyone has had an encouraging start in, you know, there are, well, positive initial signs of what's happening on the institutional side, uh, I still think we all recognize that's a fairly long way to go. So the domestic HNIs do come and primarily play a debt space, but institutions is where is the lot of the money. And what, uh, let's just try to you know, open this up to our fellow panelists and get a sense of, you know, so how do we attract more money from institutions, right? Uh, what are the few things we can do to maybe help this along the way? I understand it's a process, but you know, what are the various things we can do? We've seen some very encouraging signs in the sense that EPFO, which is Employees Provident Fund Organization, we are one of the five managers of the EPFO, and uh, they've got close to 7 lakh crores with them, and they made their initial foray into uh, public equity markets, well, even in index funds, but uh, they were in about 15 months, or is it 18 months, deployed somewhere between 15 to 20,000 crores in that. That's, that just shows you the size of, or the potential of money which they have, and this is only with 10% of incremental allocations. You know, this could obviously, at some stage, this is going to go to 15 and so on and so forth. There's no participation as yet in the AIF space, but 
you know, maybe someday, it's not likely to happen soon, but maybe someday we could look at that. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of other big funds, coal miners, pension fund, there's so much out there. And uh, also just to, you know, leave this thought with you guys and any thoughts on this thing. Uh, the mutual fund industry has possibly done a remarkable job at selling a long-term growth story in a highly volatile asset class. So when you look at it, uh, think of it, uh, equity mutual funds, uh, no returns for the last two years. No returns for the last two years. There's a lot of money still pouring in. So they're obviously selling a story very, very well. Now I understand that's a larger, single homogeneous story relative to the stories each of us are selling, which are far more discrete and smaller. But you know, is there anything for us to learn that's from a domestic, uh, uh, let's say, individual perspective? Is there anything we can try to do to, uh, let's say, get that much more money from institutions, anything else we could do, sir? Anybody, Gaurav, uh, you, oh, sorry, uh, Rahul, do you want to just, you know, try your hand at that? Any thoughts you might have which would help things along the way? Um, you know, I, I think whatever we can do to get some of these guys over the line for the first time would be helpful. And while we did not offer up, I know there's a couple of other funds out in the market that are offering things like a first loss protection. So I think for you know, insurance companies, you know, part of it is the promise, and the other is, look, I don't want to lose my job if you guys lose my money. So you know, if you are fundraising and you're off of a large platform and you have some balance sheet, you know, I think that actually does help. And um, I think it's IFMR or a couple of other guys that have actually gone out and very successfully channeled money from insurance companies actually into microfinance companies and said this is a yield play. And along the way, if there's any accidents, we'll give you some protection. So I think that's an interesting way to get these guys over the line. Specifically, you know, large treasuries and CIOs in these insurance companies are very, very risk averse. Um, so that would be one tactical way to move the needle. Um, you know, beyond that, I, I think that it's, we're very early days, IRDA didn't allow these folks, it's only been three or four years since they've been allowed to invest into AIFs. So um, what we have seen is um, a few of the large insurance companies we've met with actually now have a dedicated head of alternative investing, which is quite remarkable because typically you'll have a fixed income guy and you'll have a, an equities guy. Uh, we're now seeing people like SBI Life actually have a dedicated head of alternative investing. And, you know, he brings some amount of cycle experience, understands private equity to, you know, to some extent, and, and therefore you have an audience that's a little bit more aware and open to, you know, understanding the risk profile of what, what we're selling. So I think we should just acknowledge that the domestic institutional landscape is young, and, and I think that you know, whatever we can do to give them confidence uh, without necessarily changing the rules of the game, uh, because I don't think any of the GPs here want to offer first loss protection, but, but I think to the extent that we can be creative about helping them get comfortable with the downside, uh, that can move the needle. Sure, sure. Uh, thank, thanks, Rahul. Uh, Vishal or Muthu, anything? So uh, your question is, how do you deepen the domestic pool? Right? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, again, let me start, you know, sort of uh, slightly at a higher level. Uh, you know, in a capital ladder, we are the last resort. You know, private equity is the last resort to any uh, capital provider. Uh, so for, for takers of our capital, you know, we are costlier. And, uh, you know, if you look at it from the investor's perspective, they are, um, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, they're going to put money only when they're absolutely sure that they're going to sort of uh, get returns, which is, you know, uh, commensurate with uh, the risk. We are a decade behind, let's say, mutual fund, to touch on the point that you mentioned. Uh, but that's how it should be, because, you know, uh, mutual fund 15 years ago uh, looked like an alien concept, looked like a club culture. You know, uh, people were very apprehensive. Uh, today they are, you know, sort of uh, pretty comfortable in, you know, Exactly, it's mainstream. So uh, we will get there, and uh, you know, uh, I think a lot of things have to fall in place. Uh, there will be uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, all angles that needs to be worked on: a regulatory angle, the performance of the, you know, uh, private equity players on the, uh, you know, second side, 
and uh, the investee companies, you know, how they behave, you know, I think they're also evolving. So a lot of these things have to fall in place uh, to give the comfort that, you know, the domestic pool uh, will require. Uh, and the reason why they will need an extra comfort is that by design, we don't have the domestic pool for private equity. Banks are not supposed to be investing in uh, private equity. Insurance, like I mentioned, uh, you know, last time around is just opening up. And, uh, you know, retiral funds is just opening up. And, you know, net government funds is not positive. So these are the three sources of capital, you know, uh, for private equity elsewhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, they are building up now. So I think cut to five years from now, you'll probably look at a very different picture. You will have, you know, institutions who will have money to allocate. Uh, people would have understood that it takes time. You know, this is a 10-year thing. You know, you've, you've, uh, there will be some amount of, uh, you know, uh, probably uh, classification of data. And I think uh, to the point uh, that I think Gaurav mentioned that, you know, uh, you have a lot of gatekeepers if you go outside India. Uh, you know, there aren't many gatekeepers uh, in India. So, they, you know, they may also develop. And, uh, you know, a lot of things will have to fall in place. And, and I think capital is also building up. Uh, so we've got to, you know, sort of uh, wait for that day, which is not very far away. And uh, uh, on, the, on the GP side, I think uh, there is already uh, a certain amount of, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, bucketing of people, of performers versus non-performers. So as this uh, trend continues, you will see, you know, a certain amount of polarization. And, uh, you know, winners definitely will get uh, a lot of money. Thanks, Mutu. You know, sure. I'll largely speak uh, more on the private equity side of the business, which is growth capital, than on the real estate. I think uh, somewhere uh, the biggest disadvantage that we have is that we don't make a lot of noise. Unlike the public market side, where it is 24-7 on your face. And, uh, and something towards which the regulator or government also pays a lot of heat to. Uh, but if you really see over the last 12 years, you know, it was an alien subject up until, uh, you know, early 2000. Honestly, when I started in 2006, for the first six months, I was confused between a GP and an LP. I didn't know what a GP was or what an LP was. But if you really see how the environment has evolved over the last 10 years, and somewhere, over the last 10 years, more amount of FDI money has come on private equity than the direct FDI, uh, non-private equity FDI. And the kind of role, by and large, that the private equity funds have played in the last 10 years in terms of uh, helping a lot of small to mid-sized companies, uh, you know, get size and scale, things around corporate governance, things around, uh, you know, tax, tax, being paid by these companies. I think there was a report which captured each and every parameter where uh, companies backed by private equity funds, how they have done vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the others. And on a lot of these parameters, I think there's been a lot of positive role that the private equity fund managers have really played. Uh, and somewhere it has benefited the overall economic ecosystem as such. But I don't think we are getting enough uh, attention as far as the government or regulator is concerned. Yes, let's say when you take example of banks, clearly there is a mismatch in terms of tenure because their liability side is short term, whereas a PE fund typically is a 10 to 12 year kind of a structure. But on top of that, doing a 200% capital charge on the committed amount instead of amount drawn on, clearly uh, is, uh, you're not allowing them to invest. Uh, the taxation rules around private equity is something, again, uh, you know, which is not very helpful. So if you want this industry to grow, I think from a regulatory or government standpoint, a lot of things have to be done. A lot of things have to be done. Uh, and you have to make the, make the system or make some of uh, things in such a way where people are tempted to invest in, uh, in, in funds rather than you are, uh, you know, taking the temptation away. So I think a lot of work is required to be done before we see large pool of capital. You know, you might find some successes here and there. You might find, uh, you know, a large 
corporate houses, let's say, you know, a Reliance or the Aditya Billa or the Tata's, because of their strong brand equity and um, uh, otherwise getting ability to raise capital. But when you see an environment where a group of people with experience who've come together and started a fund can raise a lot of domestic capital, I think that will be the day when, um, you know, it would be a good uh, time for us. Thanks, thanks, Michelle. Uh, uh, Gaurav, any thoughts from your end on this matter? Anything uh, also from a regulatory perspective? Because I think we've got a, in my view, at least we've got a great set of regulations for what SEBI has put together for the AIF regulations. But anything uh, regulatory, anything on tax, uh, which would help, uh, uh, you know, making a pitch with other regulators of, you know, where, uh, uh, so that we can ensure that a little more money comes into the sector. Any thoughts around that, Gaurav, or anybody else also who would like to add to that? Sure. So I think the first thing to say is that there is a lot of optimism in terms of this, the room to grow. The United Kingdom, for example, has about 700 billion in alternative assets uh, in that sense. So it, it, it's, it, it's quite a significant leap over what India has, and there's a lot of room to grow. Now, what needs to happen in terms of deepening the market is perhaps getting things at scale as well. Scale will happen through established houses which are credible fund managers, which have the trust of people and of the institutional investors domestically to be able to grow at scale as well. So they need to grow six times, seven times what they are right now in the next five years at least. So that's one, one big area. The second, of course, is to do with uh, the, the flexibility. For example, there is a, it, it's a hybrid between regulation, tax, and the role of government, which are these massive capital injections coming in from the public sector, from government the 10,000 crore fund of fund from Government of India, or the 20,000 crore NIIF. They are great examples of how, uh, if there was a capital deficiency or some comfort needed to anchor certain professionally run independent funds, which could then attract uh, all of the other sort of pools of capital around, which need to be deployed at scale. So that, plus the flexibility in the way that the Western markets have moved. For example, along with PE investments, or come the co-investment route. And there could be uh, houses which are managing large pots of money, either for a family or for a pension fund or for insurance. That option is something that they need to uh, be attracted to uh, in a little bit more way, the way the Western markets have it as well. So the co-investment route, unlocking a lot of opportunities and giving them the exits and, and reducing the risks in their mind and the way it is. Uh, in terms of other regulatory or tax aspects, I think there have been some fundamental changes which have been made recently, a few months ago. For example, even the PF has started to allow investments to happen. Uh, we had an, uh, uh, the PFRD chairman was here and said the same thing. We have programs with them separately on policy and trying to make sure that we are hearing the market views and giving that feedback to them. So there are, there's a role for industry platforms definitely to come be the voice. And, and I think it, it's about everybody trying to bring together credible evidence because even policymakers and regulators are somehow sitting in a place where, like colleagues said, it's not an asset class that is shouting from the rooftops or 24, running 24 by 7. So they need to be sort of told with evidence about what needs to change. And a credible response then has to sort of go to them. And, and I believe that there is, uh, from our interactions with with, with policymakers and regulators, there is a willingness to, to really change and to make sure that this capital is actually being deployed usefully to, for India's growth in that sense. Thanks, thanks, Gaurav. Uh, thank you. Well, to a fellow panelist, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your insights. I'm sure everyone has enjoyed it as much as I have. So thank you so much. And uh, in conclusion, that while uh, you know, we've made a very encouraging start uh, and domestics are leaning more towards debt at this point in time, but over a period of time, and as we, we've touched upon, industries were slightly ahead of maybe where the private equity space is. Uh, you know, uh, we look forward, all of us look forward to a very, very uh, bright future and a lot of fundraising from domestic investors, both uh, individuals or HNIs, as well as, from, uh, as well as from institutions. So thank you so much and have a good day. <laughs>